Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. What role can urban areas play in confronting poverty, illiteracy, and climate change? What is one group, namely ICLEI, doing to mobilize local governments? My guest today will bring us up to date on this really interesting organization. We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're taking a look at local governments and the role that they can play in confronting some major issues such as climate change and poverty. My guest today is someone who's very knowledgeable of an organization that's working with local governments to help achieve these goals. My guest today is Mr. David Cadman. Mr. David Cadman is president of ICLEI, Local Governments for Sustainability. Mr. Cadman has been serving as a counselor at the city of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada since 2004, and he's been awarded the UN Peace Medal and the United Nations 50th Anniversary Medal. David Cadman, welcome to today's Global Connections program. It's good to be with you, Bill. I appreciate you being with me. David, let's go and talk about ICLEI. The first off, I-C-L-E-I. Yep. What exactly does it stand for, it, and what, when was it formed? It was formed in 1990. Uh, a man by the name of Noel Brown, who worked here at the UN for UNEP, uh, we, we went and talked to him and said, we think that there's a role in the future for cities. And so we formed in 1990 the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, and then it got shrank down to ICLEI Local Governments for Sustainability. And initially we started with 40 city governments, uh, and then we went up, we've gone up to 1,500 city governments. And they are among, two-thirds of the, them are the, among the largest cities in the world. And what we're trying to do is share between local governments best practices. What can we do to make our communities sustainable? What can we do to reduce greenhouse gases? What can we do to preserve biological diversity? What can we do to make mobility more efficient? What can we do in our purchasing to, to purchase goods that are good for the planet? What can we do to ma make our communities more eco-mobile, in other words, to foster more pedestrian, cycling, and public transit use. So there's a whole suite of things that we do. Not all cities are part of all of it, but all of them are part of that network. Mm -hmm. Which is very important for the urban areas. Now, you mentioned, I think, 1,500 units of local yep. government, and they're distributed in developing countries, developed countries. You have they're in 84, they're they're in 84 countries, and yeah. we've got, it's divided into nine regions, and we've got 28 offices uh, around the world and 260 staff that work on our programs. That's a sizable operation. Yeah. Yes. It's, it, 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 it keeps me up at night <laughs> trying to figure out how to raise the money for it each year. That's always a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> always. Let's talk a little bit about another concept that I know has factored into your operation over the, the past 13 years plus, and that's the Millennium Development Goals. Yeah. And we saw the Millennium Development Goal concept was developed in 2000 or formalized by the majority of the United Nations General Assembly members, the member states, and they were eight logical practical goals to reduce abject poverty by 50 percent, to mm -hmm. promote universal primary school education. Uh, number seven was to promote sustainable development. These were logical, practical, measurable goals. How have they played in, I only mentioned three of the f mm -hmm. three of the eight, but how have they played into your operation and what you're doing and working with these 1,500 governmental units? They've become a real base for that work, particularly in the developing world, because that's where they're really focused on, on how do you achieve these goals in, that, in those jurisdictions. And now they're coming to the end, and the assessment I is not too bad. Certain things have been done fairly well, other things, there's a lot to do. And so we're now shifting out of the Millennium Development Goals at the end of 2015, and we'll adopt a new set of goals, which is what we're here at the UN for right now, the Sustainable Development Goals. And that emerged from the Rio Plus 20. Rio back in 1992, when the largest gathering of heads of state 
came together and basically signed a climate change treaty, a desertification treaty, and a biodiversity treaty. And then when they went to review that 20 years later, they, out, uh, the statement that came out of there was basically we need to move toward uh, sustainable development goals. And that's the process that's begun now. The process will go through five series of meetings up until the middle of July when a report will go to the Secretary General and then there will be a meeting in the, in the fall, September, that will try and adopt those uh, sustainable development goals. Now, you mentioned Rio, yep. the 1992 UN yep. Conference on Environment and Development that yep. was commonly called the Earth Summit, as yep. I recall, the Earth Conference, Earth, Earth Summit, and that was a critical, there, there have been a lot of United Nations meetings bringing the players, the countries of the world, the non-governmental organizations, the private sector, mm -hmm. different groups like that, but th it seems like unsaid, the UN, that conference in 92 was sort of a launching pad to really promote this discussion. As I recall, Agenda 21 came out of that mm -hmm, conference, mm -hmm. the concept of sustainable development, even though Gro Harlem Brundtland had developed it earlier in a commission report. Right. But uh, what, what, is, what was the significance of those two ideas, Agenda 21 and sustainable development? Well, I, th I think the significance, uh, first of all, I, I want to give huge kudos to Morris Strong because he was the Secretary General of that conference and really put enormous emphasis And a fellow on Canadian. And a fellow <laughs> Canadian. <laughs> and, right. and put enormous emphasis on getting so many heads of state there so that it was, it was not just nations committing, but it was the top leadership of nations committing. Very important because w what it did is it launched, first of all, it, it dealt with the whole issue of climate change. And we, we, we knew climate change was, was significant. Uh, we've since had the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, pa reporting every, every five years. And they've come out right now with their fifth assessment. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it really launched us on a road of saying, things are not all well in this planet. We are exceeding the carrying capacity of this planet. And we have to figure out a way of living more sustainably or we're going to be in trouble. Well, now, according to the IPCC panel, it, we're now at five minutes to midnight. We're, we're, we're in a very awkward situation. What the significance was with, local, with, with Agenda 21 is it gave us the ability as local governments to launch local Agenda 21. And over 10,000 communities around the world engaged their citizens in discussing how do we move our community, our city, towards a sustainable future. What does that mean? What are the steps that we can take locally? What are the steps that we need to work with others, with our subnational governments, states, provinces? What are the things that we need to do to work with our national governments to really bring this to fruition? And, and I think it, it was that large engagement that was so critical to taking global issues of sustainability down to a grassroots level and understand that what happens at your community level really matters. You know, we're growing as communities for the most part, and that means that the demand for services is growing. And so we can't always find additional sources of water, of energy, uh, of fuel. So we need to figure out how we live within the constraints uh, of present capability, but more importantly, look to the future about how we can live a much more efficient lifestyle. When I think back to 1992 and that whole discussion, it, there was a lot of excitement mm -hmm. around, really around the world mm -hmm. and in the United States and elsewhere. But it, I think through this Agenda 21, when that came out, I remember a lot of businesses were very excited about it. They yep. looked upon it as sort of a blueprint mm -hmm. on how they could save money, mm -hmm. uh, improve their bottom line perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, help the environment by mm -hmm. being more ecologically friendly as far as the different practices they had. But it's been interesting. I don't know, we, Canada and the United States are neighbors, you can comment on this, but in, in the United States there's been a movement the past couple of years by some folks who look at Agenda 21 as some subversive document that's undermining the sovereignty of the United States, that's uh, trying to take over golf courses and uh, all this nonsensical stuff that does not apply to this. Is that in uh, the case in Canada or no, is it just I, I endemic th here? I, I think <laughs> it, it emerges from the Tea Party it emerges from your talk radio, your Rush Limbaugh, uh, your, some of your, your other television uh, people who, who look for villains and have looked at, at, at Agenda 21 as, as the UN trying to take over America. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's far from that. It, it, it's really a, a way of getting 
local communities to begin an in-depth discussion about the transformations that need to occur at a local level to make our future sustainable and livable. That, that we know that we're exceeding the carrying capacity of this planet right now. Uh, and in some places, we're way exceeding it. So how do we get to a point where we can live within the constraints of this one planet where we live uh, and live prosperously into the future and make a better future for our children? Because I think in all honesty, if you look at uh, those of us who, who were born into the post-war generation, life has been pretty good. It doesn't look so good on the horizon for a whole lot of young people. And we need, we, we need to have the hope of making uh, the world better, a better place for the future generations. Mm -hmm. And as we look at this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report mm -hmm. that came out, they focused to a large degree on this situation. They were talking about, that was the fifth report, as yep. I recall you mentioned, and of course, 90, something like 97% of the climate scientists believe that climate change is taking place. Mm -hmm. It is occurring, the seas are rising, the deserts are becoming more, uh, are hotter and desertification is encroaching on mm -hmm. urban areas and green areas and what have you. But uh, that report was very critical, was it not, as far as helping to helping us better understand some of the implications of what is looming over the horizon if we don't get a better handle on climate change? I think, I think there, there are three volumes of this report. The first one has come out right now. There are two more still to come. They're all very good, but they're, they're, they're very cautious. They're scientifically uh, cautious. And the trouble with it is that it's really looking at scientific data from the last four years. So we're trying to look at the future by looking at the past mm -hmm. and looking at science and its verified reports. We're in a situation right now where, where the two degree centigrade uh, or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit that we, the world said we cannot go beyond that. We're in like, like, likely on a path to, to supersede that uh, in the very near future. And one of the things that has been happening is it's been going slower because we didn't factor in the extent to which the oceans, which cover two thirds of the planet, and their depth, which is massive, would in fact absorb so much of the heat. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the oceans have a limited capacity to absorb CO2 and are beginning to move now uh, towards acidification, which means that many of the uh, aquatic species that make shells or skeletons are having trouble doing that now, which means that the food chain uh, in the oceans is being affected as well. So the panel is, is very clear that we need to slow down by, by converting from a carbon energy formula to a renewable energy formula. So moving to wind, moving to solar, moving to geothermal, uh, moving to things that give us the capability of, of really transforming our and living energy efficiently. Uh, we know that in urban areas, uh, probably 40% of the energy is buildings and probably the other 40% is transportation. We know we can make more efficient buildings. We know we can actually make buildings that are energy positive. We know that. We know that the transportation sector it can be transformed. Um, you know, we, we, we live in a culture that is the single occupant vehicle is king. The reality is with only 30 to 50 percent of any city being available for public use, we can't add additional road capacity in our cities. So we've got to figure out a way of moving people around our cities with better public transit, better pedestrian and cycling facilities, and at least getting to the point where if cars are going to be uh, a mode that they're shared vehicles as opposed to single occupant vehicles. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is an independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. Today, we're looking at the role of urban governments and urban areas as far as confronting issues such as poverty, climate change, illiteracy, and several others. And my guest today is an expert in this area. My guest today is Mr. David Cadman. Mr. Cadman is the global president of ICLE, and we're talking about the role of local governments and how important it is that they get involved because they have a stake. Well, we all have a stake in mm -hmm. all, every, every, all 7.2 billion people on planet Earth. And 
You mentioned earlier about how we've reached this overcapacity. Mm -hmm. Some of the studies that have come out recently have really been uh, alarming, I think, to yeah. a large degree. Uh, scientists are saying now if we continue the uptick, and everybody wants to aspire to what we call a middle socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just logical to want to improve your quality of life wherever you may be, and many people are doing that. We mm -hmm. see ch uh, China has progressed quite dramatically. Many other countries have uh, progressed. The standard of living is going up in many areas. But while we do that, we consume more and more of the natural resources. We put more and more strains on the planet. And it seems now they're saying that we need another three or four Earths just to absorb what we're putting out and how much we're extracting. This is this it seems to be a very alarming statistic, and I don't think I think they have a lot of scientific data to support it. They do, uh, and the reality is there only is one Earth. We've never found another one. <laughs> That's right. And you know, people can talk about colonizing the Moon and colonizing Mars. The reality is we have to live here, and we have to figure out how to make this place work for the betterment of all. We can do it. The, the thing that's happening right now is 52% of the world's population lives in cities. By the middle of the century, 75% of the world's population will live in cities. By the end of the century, 90% of the world's population will live in cities. Over the next 40 years, we will build more in cities than has built in time immemorial. In other words, we've never built as much. So we have the ability to build it right. Instead of building a building that requires massive input of energy for its heating and cooling, why not build a building that draws geothermal from the ground and warms it in winter and cools it in summer from, from the natural level of temperature under the ground? Why not build the southern exposure of both its roof and, uh, and its wall to begin to collect solar energy? There are buildings like that that have been built now and are actually energy positive. So the, the building is giving back to the grid instead of having to draw from the grid. And so that means we don't have to build as many power plants. It means we don't have to use as many fossil fuels. We can begin to transform our lifestyle in urban areas. The other problem that we have with climate change is that two thirds of humanity lives adjacent to the ocean. And if we're looking at somewhere between a two and a seven foot rise in the oceans, depending on when we get to restrictions on greenhouse gas commitments, many of our coastal cities are gonna be flooded. Mm -hmm. You experienced that here with Sandy. Uh, you know, other cities have experienced it. But the other thing that's also happened simultaneously is because the oceans are getting warmer, there's more uptake of moisture and we've got five to seven percent more moisture in the atmosphere right now that's coming down sporadically as rain in different places. And when I said that, the chief meteorologist of Canada called me up and said, no, you're wrong. You've got to describe this as we have rivers of water in the sky. And that's what hit Boulder, Colorado this summer. Mm -hmm. And I talked to the mayor of Boulder, who's an ICLEI member, and he said, you know, we, we never envisaged that all five rivers would flood simultaneously, but they did. Mm -hmm. Calgary, Alberta, they never, they, they, two years, three years ago, they, they had their, their hundred year uh, storm. Just this summer, they had one that was five times as large because the quantities of water up there have to come down somewhere. And we've seen it in northern Nigeria, we've seen it in northern Pakistan, we've seen it now <coughs> in England, where all of these rivers are flooding. So this is another reality that w we're going to have to adapt to where we live. Exactly. And if our viewers would like more information on what we're talking about today, they can go to www.iclei.org and learn a lot more about your different yep. projects and some of the other topics. Uh, going back to this thing though, as far as the dramatic change in the weather patterns, mm -hmm. this is something, of course we've seen areas that have been hit by typhoons, but mm -hmm. as you mentioned, they're accelerating. They're, they're yep. becoming more frequent and more intense. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really frightening. We saw what happened in the Philippines, mm -hmm. that horrific typhoon that went through. We saw, uh, Bangladesh floods yep. probably every year yep. and the flooding is getting worse. Pakistan yep. had severe flooding not t too long ago. Yep. And these are, these are certainly warning signs that we really have to do something differently. And of course the United Nations had the UN uh, 
uh, well, the Rio Plus 20 Sustainable mm -hmm. Development Conference in 2012, I guess it right. was, and then in Warsaw, Poland, 2013. Now there's going to be a conference 2014 in Lima, Peru, and yep. a, a big one in 2015 in Paris. Mm -hmm. How important are these upcoming conferences? They're, they're absolutely critical because <laughs> what happened was we thought we were going to get to a post-Kyoto framework in Copenhagen in 2009. And the conference, it didn't get there. And so they said, okay, well, we'll get to it by 2015. We'll work between now and 2015, and we'll get there. But they then said, well, we'll get there in 2015, but it won't be implementable until 2020. So we're looking at a gap of, of what, 12 years between a failure and a potential agreement. And, you know, we're a long way from an agreement right now. Mm -hmm. But they have to come up with a draft agreement by the end of this year when we get to Lima. And that will become the negotiating basis for a final agreement uh, in Paris. But there are a lot of differences. There, there, it's very hard to get nation states which, which are dependent upon coal or dependent upon oil or dependent upon gas or all three to move to a position where effectively four-fifths of the found energy that we have can never be burned because if we do, we're going to go way over the two degrees centigrade. And even now, um, because of climate change and the melting of the Arctic Ocean uh, and the Arctic mm -hmm. ice cap, we're now finding that there's more blue water exposed, which attracts more heat and absorbs more heat, which is then affecting the land mass, which means that the permafrost, the land that is permanently frozen uh, in the north of Canada, in Alaska, and, and in, the, in, in Russia, is beginning to melt. And when that melts, it gives off, uh, it gives off methane. And methane mm -hmm. is 23 <coughs> times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. So the feedback loops are beginning to ki kick in. The oceans are giving off methyl hydrates. Uh, they can't absorb any more CO2. So they're giving off methyl hydrates, which again are a greenhouse gas. So once the oceans begin to give off and the land begins to give off, then you're, you're into a, a, a continuous loop where human activity, if putting that genie back in the bottle, is very difficult. Mm -hmm. And if we think back to not too many years ago when former Vice President Al Gore yep. had the inconvenient truth, yep. which really started the, uh, not, uh, not started, but really fueled the discussion to a large degree. And he referenced the tipping point, yep. where if we continue consuming at the rate we're consuming, populating the earth at the rate we're populating, that we're going to go beyond that point where we can actually reverse it. Do you think we've gone beyond that tipping point? Will we ever stop climate change? Or is the best we can hope for is to slow it down and be adapt to it to a large degree? I, I, th I know we can stop it. The question is whether we will. And, and that, that, that's going to take a lot of willpower of nation states to say the consequence of not doing this is that we have many, many disasters. And you, you can go to the reinsurance companies who will say, look, we're doing the calculations here and this is going to become more and more costly. I don't know what the final price tag was on Sandy, but somewhere in the order of $15 billion. And I suspect by the time it's really worked out, it's going to be well above that, 20 to $30 billion. So there is a cost on the one side, and yet the cost of actually moving to a, um, a low carbon energy cycle <coughs> will cost about 2%. And we don't need to look at, upon it as a diminished standard of living. It can be actually an improved standard of living where instead of building a disposable culture, we build a renewable culture. I mean, mm -hmm. you look at the average, well, I walk up and down New York City and I look at the waste that's in the street post-Christmas. And, and a lot of that is boxes and packaging and things that really, uh, yes, they, they're part of marketing and part of selling, but, but they are waste finally. And we need to figure out how to bring more of that, more of the things that become waste so quickly, back into uh, recycling mm -hmm. and, and figuring out how to use the materials over and over and over again, rather than simply a one time one, out, out the door and into the waste. Exactly. David, in the last minute we have, why is it important to have an urban sustainable development goal, an urban SDG after 2015? 
It's important because half the world's population <coughs> lives in cities today, and as I said, 75% will live there by the middle of the century and 90% by the end. If we don't get the urban solution correct, there is no way we can move globally towards sustainability. The urban agenda is now driving our future, and we've got to figure out a way through an urban agenda of sitting down and looking at the things that we do in cities that we could do differently and make a brighter future for all people who live in cities, but a sustainable future for our cities. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the urban areas do play a critical role in this as we see that they, they have to be involved yep. and they can make some very important contributions and they have done so in the past. Yep. Many of the mayors around the world have adopted the Kyoto Protocol. We yep. see that even though the United States government did not, many of the mayors are over a thousand cities I think in the United States that have taken on Kyoto to a large degree and are implementing some of the changes. Yep. But David Cadman, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. My pleasure to be with you, Bill. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on today's Global Connections program.